Representative Diane Lanford. I live here in Virgins and have been representing this district for uh, a few years now. Um, and I'm also here with uh, Matt Barong, Representative Barong, who's my district mate and uh, freshman. And I want to also make sure that we send a nice thanks to Marley Hunt. She is the student organizer who did all the all the work around prepping to get the room and things and uh, and other groups that did um, the advertising. So I want to introduce our speakers tonight, and um, that is going to be Senator um, Chris Pearson and Representative Sarah copeland Hoff. They are in the leadership of our Climate Solutions Caucus, which myself and Matt and many other people that are in the room here are also members of, and I see where is there? Senator Bray, and Senator Ruth Hardy is also here, and. Um, also represent us at the county level, and oh, and Mari, Mari. Horace is at the at the desk from Addison Four. Anybody else? Select board or city council member David Austin. I think everybody in here were probably related in one way or another, but <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how it works. But we're here tonight because we have been, or mostly, a lot of the leadership and a lot of hard work has gone into being better communicators around what we're doing. There's a lot of energy and work and talk that happens in Montpelier, but it doesn't always get out into the public. And so tonight, we want to, with the leadership, present what we're thinking about and let them present that and then get everybody's feedback so that as we approach um, January, we can uh, bring your thoughts and wishes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, and I'm going to go sit in the back. Great. All right, thank you. So thank you all for being here tonight. I know on a Friday night there's probably other things that you could be doing, and so I appreciate that you're here. Um, we are uh, we're here tonight to help um, start a conversation with folks around the community about some of the priorities that the Vermont Legislative Climate Solutions Caucus is uh, intending to put forward for uh, 2020 legislative session. Um, why are we doing this? Well. Uh, we were we were not satisfied with the, uh, the the progress that was made in the last legislative session. And when we got done in May, and we realized, you know, this is how much we did, and this is the challenge that we feel we have before us, um, we didn't we weren't satisfied that that the amount of progress that we made was uh, was commensurate with the challenge of the moment that we're in. Um, and so we came together at the end of May, right after the legislative session got, uh, got done, and uh, 35 members of the Climate Solutions Caucus came back to Montpelier for an all-day meeting um, to, to really just put our heads to where do we want to be a year from now? Where do we want to be at the end of the 2020 session? Um, and, you know, clearly our objective is to be able to say we have started to put Vermont on the right path for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so from that, thank you, that's really helpful to have the lights turned down now. You can probably see a little bit more. Um, from that uh, all-day um, retreat, we came up with four, uh, four groups of legislators who were going to work on different things. Uh, one, uh, three of them were working on policy. And so we had a transportation policy working group, we had a green economy and renewable energy working group, and we had a building energy and um, uh, thermal efficiency working group. The fourth working group was, uh, was really kind of um, put together, and Mari's on that, that fourth working group, uh, to help roll out a public engagement process in the fall. And so we sent the policy working groups to to do their work over the summer. We said we need your report back by Labor Day. Uh, Labor Day, we took all of the recommendations and it numbered probably 25 or 30 pages of re recommendations, ideas, um, strategies that Vermont <coughs> could use to bring our communities together to bend the curve on our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and those, uh, those policies we distilled into what we, what we saw as kind of four major policy um, objectives that, that we'll go through here uh, this evening, and then um, a whole slew of other little things that can be inserted into bills that are already moving. They're not new ideas. They're not going to require a new bill. They're something that you can tuck into the transportation bill that's already moving, or it's something that you can tuck into uh, an education bill that's already moving. 
Um, so the four banner bills we'll talk about tonight, but before I do that, I just want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page in terms of why are we concerned about this? Why are we here? So uh, it's hard to see the yellow dotted line, but there is a yellow dotted line that, um, that represents our uh, statutory goals. And when you see statutory goals, you need to read aspirations, and we'll come back to that. These are the aspirations that we have in terms of how, uh, how Vermont will reduce uh, its greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels. The black line, of course, is the actual uh, emissions that we've seen. And as you can see, not only are we not bending the curve, but uh, in the most recent years, uh, we are actually on the rise in terms of our emissions. Um, where are Vermont's emissions coming from? Uh, is very much informs the areas that we need to focus on. And um, so what you see in the black swath at the bottom is your transportation emissions, and the red swath above it is, is heating. So heating our homes, heating our businesses, heating our buildings. Um, those are the biggest areas uh, that, that contribute to Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions. It's not unlike uh, many other rural states that have um, you know, high transportation and high heating emissions. Uh, but those are the places that we need to concentrate uh, strategies to help us um, meet our goals. So uh, why, are we, why are we concentrating on this? Well, in addition to, uh, to recognizing that, uh, that emissions are causing climate change that is threatening the existence of uh, not only human beings, but many other species around the globe, uh, there's a really good pocketbook reason why we should be focused on this, and there it goes again. Um, so when we use fossil fuels to get ourselves around or to heat our buildings, um, 80 cents of every dollar is going right out of the state. Okay, And so to the extent that we can weatherize our homes so that we're using less heat to begin with, and transition to renewable energy for heating and uh, maybe electricity for our school buses and for our personal vehicles and for our bicycles, um, we can keep more of that money flowing in the Vermont economy because the less it costs me to drive um, to work and back, <coughs> the more money I keep in my family's pocketbook and the more I can use in my own community. And so there's a very good uh, pocketbook reason why um, the shifting over to locally generated renewable energy uh, is going to be good for the Vermont economy. And there's more about that story uh, coming up as we talk more about the details of the bill. So I'm going to let Chris Pearson take over right now. Um, before I do that, I just want to point out to you that this picture right here is, um, is a picture of the fog laying in the Connecticut River Valley and the sun rising over it on a morning in early September. Um, this is the reason why we need to focus on what we're doing here, because we all have that special place that, that we believe um, really fills our heart and, and fills our souls. And the, uh, the challenges that we have before us in climate change are threatening many of these uh, really special places. And so I'm going to let Chris talk a little bit about the first policy priorities. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm Chris Pearson. Uh, I'm a senator from Chittenden County, uh, and I'm proud to currently serve as a co-chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus. Um, and the process Sarah laid out with the work that we've been doing since session ended, um, we really challenged our folks to, to work within the confines of things that we could achieve that were achievable meaning we could pass them. We work for four and a half months a year. That's not a lot of time to dig into intense uh, and complex policy. And also that would be meaningful. Um, and so uh, th those are, you know, sometimes competing odds. We want to be ambitious. We want to prove to ourselves and to Vermonters that we can make significant progress. But by no means does this represent sort of good job works over uh, mindset at all. We, we really see this as uh, launching. Um, I want to say that it's critical we, uh, as we approach this work that we recognize when we do it well, when we, when we hit solutions that are meaningful, we will strengthen our economy. 
and we will be mindful of the fact that far too many Vermonters uh, are struggling to make ends meet, are truly living paycheck to paycheck. The idea of buying an electric vehicle for most Vermonters is completely uh, a complete fancy. And, and so we need to be mindful of that. We need to recognize the economic hardship that many Vermonters are facing when we approach this challenge. Um, we also, I think, and, and we have been talking about over and over, building on successes that we already have in Vermont. And, and what is unique to Vermont, there are many aspects that actually lend themselves well to ta tackling the climate emergency, not the least of which is a strong sense of community. Um, so it's with that lens that we compiled this 25, 30 pages of ideas. Legislators are rarely shy about having ideas and try to narrow it down to something that was achievable and significant. And we came up with, as you have to, anytime you're talking about climate, with these four areas, I believe. Transportation, as you heard, is our single uh, biggest contributor to emissions. Building efficiency <coughs> is second. Uh, energy uh, production and energy efficient is, uh, efficiency is our third plank. And then accountability. Um, so let's talk about transportation. Has everybody, anybody here heard of Reggie? Okay, we've got a few hands. Reggie is a regional greenhouse gas initiative. It's something that Jim Douglas got us started on in Vermont um, in about, when was that, 12 years ago or so, 10 years ago? 09. 09, says Senator Bray, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Reggie is, uh, uh, stands for Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. It is an agreement between as many as 9 to 11 states. It's fluctuated a little bit. And it has to do with uh, the northeastern regions uh, commitment to reduce emissions through from the uh, energy production, from electric production, okay? And it has worked really well for Vermont, and most people in the state are, uh, no, are not at all aware that Reggie exists. But it has been very effective to close down coal and oil and even some natural gas electric generation in the region. And because Vermont didn't really have very much of those producers, what it's meant to Vermont is we've had an influx of money. And that has helped us keep our rates low as the whole regional grid kind of balances out and gets much more renewable. It's been very effective for Vermont. The Transportation Climate Initiative, some called, sometimes called TCI, builds off of that model. It's a regional approach to do similar work in the transportation sector. And it is exciting to me because it extends, all 12 states are engaged from Maine over to New York, down to Virginia. And that, and that includes everyone in between, which is some pretty significant heavyweights compared to the, the significant weight that Vermont pulls. But you gotta admit, you know, compared to New York and Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, you know, we're, we're a bump on the, on the chart, but a significant leadership role, I hope. So all 12 of those states have been engaging in a dialogue for at least a year and a half around what could TCI look like. It is basically uh, imagined to be a cap and invest system, very much like Reggie. And the idea is that fuel distributors for gasoline and diesel fuel for our vehicles would pay a surcharge and contributing st uh, states that are involved in this would then have revenue so that we can invest in sustainable transportation futures. This is really exciting because it's way way bigger than Vermont, which, you know, even if we were 100% sustainable, uh, we need more partners in this. Um, and so it, it, has, it has the potential to have a much bigger impact. It also, frankly, is politically much more uh, realistic because it's not us going alone. And uh, any legislator will tell you any idea you have, uh, you're immediately compared to New Hampshire and, and, oh my gosh, everybody will buy everything from New Hampshire. So, so we have to deal with that regional approach. It's really a strong basis. Um, we don't know exactly what it looks like. We're expecting an update from the 12 governors in December. The hope is that the legislature can pass enabling legislation to get us engaged in this. You know, negotiating this stuff is complex with 12 states. It, it, I think it's realistic that it might get slowed down, and that's a shame because we're late. Uh, but the bottom line is this is very promising, and the regional approach is the way we have to go forward, a lot of us believe. What the Climate Solutions Caucus wants to do, assuming we have a moment here to um, move forward with TCI, is put some parameters around that revenue coming into the state. You know, we also have 
an ongoing budget deficit for our roads and bridges and our tr traditional transportation budget. This is not meant to send revenue to fix that problem. Uh, we really need to make sure this money is invested in sustainable transportation options for Vermonters. Uh, also, we're exploring something that I think is very promising, actually an idea that originated in Massachusetts, and that is that you can bond. <coughs> Since we have predictable revenue coming in through this program, uh, that lends itself to a so-called revenue bond. And climate solutions do very well with upfront investment. So you take a diesel bus off the road, dirty diesel bus, a clean diesel bus if people believe there's such a thing, and you put an electric bus on the, on the road, you win right away. Right away you're, you're on a plus in terms of emissions. You also win next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. And so if you can front load your investment, there's a great benefit uh, in terms of our emission reduction. And so the idea is you could bond, uh, because we have predictable revenue coming in through this idea, through the setup, we could bond for and use that money and amplify our impact immediately, right out of the gate. Now I say immediately, but even if all 12 states agree, right, there's going to be some lag time pulling this infrastructure together. And so um, we have a lot of other smaller ideas that we're going to continue building on the work we've been doing, investing in uh, charging stations and subsidies to help people get into electric cars, in park and rides, all sorts of strategies that we can talk about that is underway and we need to keep accelerated. But Transportation Climate Initiative is a big deal and, and has a lot of promise. Um, and of course, we're going to have to make sure it's as strong as it can be and, and all that work. But this is coming and coming hopefully quickly. Building efficiency. This is building our old homes leak energy, uh, leak uh, heat out. And so we're burning more fossil fuel to heat our buildings. There's a lot of work to do here. This is our second biggest contributor to emissions. And the, we are going to continue to work on weatherizing. We're going to continue to fight for more investments in our weatherizing program. Just this past year, we expanded the budget for weatherizing by about 50%, and we kicked it into a middle-income plan. Not only we've been focused historically on low-income, which is a good approach, but we need to be as broad as possible. But outside of that, which is ongoing work, we've also come to recognize a few things through the working groups. One is. We have good building codes in Vermont, and when you build a big building, build a school or you build an office structure or whatever, there's a pretty good chance those buildings live up to code because there's engineers involved and architects and all these professionals whose professional license is on the line, and they follow the law because they don't want to lose their license. The joke is that our homes also are meant to, are, are required to live up to code, but because you don't have that level of professionalism involved, the joke is they're voluntary. Now, we're probably not going to be able to figure out a, uh, an enforcement mechanism and fund that this year, but at a minimum, we want to start talking about who in state government oversees this code enforcement. It is sort of an orphan program in state government. We need to give it a home. Um, more immediate, and I think kind of interesting because it's, it's so, so obvious, I'm sure you'll sort of be frustrated that we haven't already done this, but I think it's meaningful. We have thousands of professionals in the state who intersect with Vermonters every day in their homes. These are realtors, real estate appraisers, uh, HVAC contractors, general contractors, plumbers. All of these people, well not contractors, but we're working on that. There's a bill underway right now. All of these professionals um, are licensed by the state. They get to re-up their license just like a nurse and a teacher and other professionals. They have to re-up their license every two years. And that is a moment when they're interacting with the state. And that is a moment that we need to take advantage of. Because these folks are talking to thousands of Vermonters and helping us make decisions about what I'm going to do in my home, what I'm going to replace my furnace with, what I'm going to sell my house, and, and how do we value solar array on my roof that currently is not really handled in appraisals. Um, all of these uh, professionals who are interacting with us, we need them on board, we need them as partners in this challenge, and we can do that fairly simply because we're already intersecting with them. And we need them to be aware of their goals, we need them to hopefully be aware of the options that they can present to Vermonters, we need them to be aware of the subsidies in many cases, 
that are available to Vermonters when we're make, making this significant investment in our homes, which is after all for most Vermonters their single biggest investment. We need these partners to help us and at a minimum we got to educate them and we've got to move down the road where they're really uh, uh, helping Vermonters make these choices. I'll give you another example. It's not a, a licensed professional, but folks who sell us cars. You walk onto the lot and you've got your wallet burning a hole, you know you're going to write a big check or you're going to take out a, some kind of loan to buy a car. Those folks need to be educated about the, the subsidies, the federal tax credits, the state programs, utilities, all of sorts of incentives exist out there to, to shift people into electric cars. But it really breaks down if the person that you're talking to who's showing you some different models is not aware of them and is maybe not motivated to get you into the electric car that's way out in the corner. So we need to have that discussion. That's a little trickier because they're not licensed, but it's a kind of example where the workforce needs to be, we need to partner with them and we need to help them help us make these, these changes happen. Then you get into electricity and energy and efficiency. Um, everybody's heard of Efficiency Vermont, I hope, by now, right? Efficiency Vermont is something that works and something we can be really proud of. We were the first state to create an efficiency utility statewide in 2000. They now have a suite of professionals in Efficiency Vermont whose entire job is to go around the country and the world and help other people do the same thing. This is working. And we have, uh, we have expertise there, we have, uh, we have, they have relationships with our businesses, they have done great work and saved us money. In fact, we are using less electricity today as Vermonters than we were in 2000 when we started the program. But if you were investing $60 million a year in efficiency, in energy efficiency, you would not only look at the electric sector. In fact, you might argue you wouldn't look at the electric sector at all, you would look at the fossil fuel sector. And so we kicked off a, a, a transition, and Senator Bray was instrumental in this, took a real leadership role last year um, to help us transition efficiency Vermont into an all fuels efficiency. Uh, this has great promise. Efficiency Vermont's excited about it. Public Utility Commission, uh, who regulates them, is quite interested in this. Uh, the utilities seem interested. This is an exciting opportunity for us, and we need to accelerate that transition and make sure uh, we get those professionals out there quickly. This is some, a, a resource we can deploy quickly. It builds on tremendous success that we have right here in state. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, we also have done a decent job deploying renewable energy in the state. And we've done that in a number of ways. And there are people in the room who know more than I do about it. So uh, forgive me if I get the details wrong. But uh, it goes back maybe 15 years, and we set goals for ourselves. Uh, and we said that the utilities by 2032 need to get 75% of their electricity from renewable sources, and 10% of that from in-state renewables. Um, and actually the utilities are there, most of them, many of them are at 100% already. So we want to push that 75% number up to 100%. And um, I think we have the opportunity to do that. It won't be, you know, going to be 100% tomorrow, but we want to put them on a path to 100%. We also want to get more than 10% of our renewable energy from in-state. And we want to look at doubling that. Um, that creates jobs, by the way, right away. That's an important factor. Uh, it creates resilience, has the potential to have resilience for us, uh, create a stronger localized grid. Uh, we just saw the, the sort of strange storms right around Halloween. Our, our friends down in Hartford, Vermont, Heartland, Vermont, were out of power for four days. You know, that's, that is not acceptable. There, there's no reason for that. Now, solar doesn't solve that immediately, but there's also a very exciting conversation happening around storage. And now you start to pair uh, renewable technology with storage, and, and you start to get some really interesting opportunities opening up. And by the way, we should be able to do this now that solar prices have come down. Uh, so intensely that we should be able to do this at a very affordable rate and create jobs and create resilience here in Vermont. Um, so, you know, one of the, they, they, some of these are tweaks to, we, we sort of, you know, when, when net metering was started, 
And standard offer is another way we get electric generation on, in the Vermont grid, and, and most of your solar around here or standard offer. Uh, the, the attitude was, let's try some things. Let's see if this works. And in many ways, it exploded. And it was really, people really intensely engaged in it and very excited. And folks like Sun Common, and you have local solar installers here. And everybody, you know, started creating tons of solar power. In some ways, it, 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 went, it was more successful than we expected. And people sort of said, OK, well, we, we need to dial back some of the some of the um, adders, which were adding value to your solar energy. And you know, it's been tweaked a lot. And so I would argue maybe we've clamped back too much. You're seeing uh, solar developers will tell you it's hard now to build solar. You know, but we're still building solar. But we've also learned that it doesn't do you much good to power this building with a solar array that's 30 miles off the road, right? You need to build arrays right near the off takers so that you're not, so it's efficient, so that you're not losing power as you move it along the grid lines. Um, so these are the kinds of improvements that we're making and, and want to make sure uh, the, the policy kind of keeps up with our advanced understanding uh, of the technology. Um, and I think I'll pass it back over to Sarah for a very important one around accountability. All right, so accountability. Um, first, I want to call your attention to the graph on the right. Um, again, you'll notice the, this time the statutory goals or aspirations, as we call them, are the green dots. Um, and you'll notice the same shape of the, of the line that's the solid green at the top, which is Vermont's emissions. Um, and I want to contrast that with the blue <coughs> line, which is Massachusetts emissions. And you'll notice that um, Vermont and Massachusetts track along uh, fairly close to each other uh, up until about 10 years ago. Uh, that's when Massachusetts um, enacted their Global Warming Solutions Act, um, which is uh, the, the bill that we want to talk about adopting here in Vermont. Um, Global Warming Solutions Act is going to uh, infuse some accountability so that we no longer say we have all of these aspirations of reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. We have aspirations to stop sending, uh, you know, two billion dollars out of the state every year, uh, but but nobody's ever really come together to figure out how to make that happen. Um, so we're going to turn our aspirations into requirements in statute and uh, getting, getting the levels of those um, uh, targets right uh, is important. And so that's a conversation that's happening right now. Um, because you can see that we're on kind of a uh, ski jump, you know, tall, uh, tall um, increase in our emissions right now, you can imagine that it's going to be challenging for us to turn that around. So what we will do, um, I think for the short-term goals, is to say, let's pledge right now that we're going to meet our Paris climate reduction goals, right? So uh, when President Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, Governor Scott said Vermont will meet its Paris climate goals. And he joined in the U.S. Climate Alliance with 30-something other governors from around the country who have all pledged that even though Washington, D.C. is ignoring this problem right now, these governors are going to work towards meeting that goal. So in the short term, in 2025, uh, we're going to aim for a Paris um, reduction. And then for the out years, uh, like 2050, we're going to try to aim for a net zero, which means, you know, hopefully that we get to 80, 85% renewable with, uh, with you know, 15% of new sequestration activities that, uh, that we know will um, account for some of the emissions that we can't get rid of. Um, so there will be check-ins along the way. You know, we're not going to just set it at 2050 and forget it. We know that we need to have interim goals 25, uh, 2025, 2030, 2040. Um, but this is really a strategy that will focus all of state government on the business of cutting emissions. So that the transportation agency will talk with the agency of natural resources, will talk with the ag agency, uh, will come to the legislature and say this is what we need for focus, for attention, for resources to make these things happen. And it's going to demand that we come together and figure it out because the accountability 
part about this allows for Vermonters a private right of action to say to your state government, you're not making it happen. We, you told us you were going to meet the Paris Climate Goals. You haven't made it happen. Um, you know, we are going to sue and make sure that you do. So it's going to turn those um, aspirational goals into binding requirements, and we really feel that this is kind of foundational to the future actions <coughs> that we know we need to do. This is not a one and done. This is the foundation, this is the, the starting point that will compel us to come back and to put into place a lot of the things that Chris was talking about as being kind of um, next year targets that we're, that we're looking towards. Um, so the Global Warming Solutions Act is being worked on right now. It'll, it will likely start in the House Committee and then it will end up at some point in Senator Bray's committee. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work right now to coordinate that because, as Chris said at the beginning, our legislative session is short and we have to hit the ground running and be ready to move quickly to move these through. And so that's part of the reason why we're here to talk with, with you. This is the fifth of six of these talks that I'm doing this week. I was in Brattleboro, I was in St. Johnsbury, I was in Essex, I'm here tonight, tomorrow I'll be in West Fairley, Monday I'll be back in Hartford. And then, oh, next week is Thanksgiving, so I only have to do one next week. So it's a good thing I still have my voice. <laughs> um, but at any rate, I, you know, all joking aside, the reason we're coming out to talk with people is because we really want to, we want you to understand that we're taking this seriously, um, and our group is growing, right? So we, we have, uh, over the course of the fall, you know, every week or so, another legislator would call and say, can I join the Climate Solutions Caucus? And I think that's because people like you are calling your legislators and saying, are you on board with the climate agenda? Um, and that's super helpful. Um, so that is it for the, uh, the four banner priorities that we have for the year. Um, you know, we don't want to go through the 27 pages of recommendations that, uh, that include lots of the little nitty gritty. Um, but I don't know <coughs> if, uh, if folks have clarifying questions, if folks have a, well, did you think about this, or why is why don't I hear more about that? Um, we're happy to take some questions, and then um, and then we can hang around and visit afterward. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you. First, I appreciate all the thought that you put into this. Um, I have had gut wrenching fear since reading IPCC reports. Six months ago, I hadn't really. I would. I knew it was bad, but not as bad as it is. And even the name Climate Solutions implies that we can be solved. They can't. And I think that um, a lot of your plan depends on partners. And if people don't know how dire this is, they're not going to bother. So I really need you to be um, more scared in front of us. And. And we need, to, we need you to feel panicked so that we can get our neighbors to be panicked too. Because people just... So I, I don't disagree with you on one level. But on another level, I know that there's a lot of people who are my neighbors, who I talk to when we're standing in line at the grocery store, who are psychologically or emotionally just full up enough with getting the kids home, getting them dinner, getting them to bed, and getting them off to school in the morning so they can be on time for work. Because if they're late one more time, they're going to lose their job kind of thing. And so I, I always want to balance the, oh my god, this is a crisis, with the reality that we need to be able to engage people <coughs> for whom they're just trying to get through the day and the week and make it to the next paycheck to try to scrape together enough to pay their bills. We know that we need to engage all Vermonters in doing that. And there are plenty of people who have the capacity and who have come to these meetings and said exactly what you're saying to us. I don't think you're taking this seriously enough. I promise you I am. <laughs> I promise you I'm taking it very seriously. Um, but I want to make sure that we present this in a way that engages with people kind of regardless of what level of you know, the panic scale they're on. And um, so please know that when I wake up at 3 in the morning, I say to myself, 
I'm doing everything I can to try to move a bold climate agenda, and that's how I sleep at night. I just think that there's a lot of people who, who think it's a problem and it's really bad, and they don't know how bad. I mean, it's really easy with the parallel narratives going on in our country to say, oh, it's not that big of a deal, we can solve it, we can fix it, and we can't. At this point, it's mitigation and adaptation. And I just think that needs to be clear. So too. we are, you know, we're sowing the we're sowing the, the ground right now and hoping for that, you know, that first bright sunny day of spring to really to really pop those seeds and, and, and have it start growing. And it's not unlike what it's not unlike the, the, the landscape was around gun safety legislation where <laughs> There had been a group of us who had been talking about these are practical solutions that we ought to adopt, and it wasn't until Parkland and Fairhaven happened bang, bang, that finally <coughs> something changed and, and what we thought was impossible became possible. So I agree with you that we need to be focused on mitigation, we need to be focused on resiliency, we need to be thinking about sequestration because we even if we stop today, <clears throat> There's too much carbon in the atmosphere. We need to we need to be able to draw that down. And, and I'll just say that we're doing these meetings all over, um, and usually the audience has a climate denier or two, and or seven. has has a, a pack of people who are glad to understand and plug in a little bit, and has uh, a handful of people who are um, sort of chiding us for not going forward. You know, we serve to set policy, and I've always believed that we have a role, a role as educators um, to the state. The fact is, we can only be so far in front of the public. I mean, I, I supported a carbon tax. I, I believe I was the first legislator to introduce a carbon tax in Vermont six years ago. Uh, I got a job 21 years ago working for Bernie because of climate change. Like, the, the, this is an evolution for, uh, in, we started the Climate Caucus in 2011, I think, 2012. Um, you know, and, and Diane was one of the founding members with me, and, and we had, you know, we, we brought a lot of legislators up to speed on, on the, the emergency. <coughs> um, and we've now finally reached a moment where the public is clamoring, and we're like, well, great, we're organized and we're, we're ready to do it. Um, the challenge is always going to be, most of these policy things don't cost a lot of money. The, po the challenge is going to be next year when we say, okay, you know, we're going to have to really amplify the weatherization work. Um, and, and, you know, but Burlington, where I live, announced that they're trying to be net zero by 2030. And that is fantastic. That is a reasonable response to the emergency. That involves weatherizing a lot of old timber frame homes in Burlington. Even if they have the money, there's not the workers to do that work. And so we, we you know, so somewhere in here is the balance as best as we can do. And it is, you know, we, we, we're not giving purchase to the deniers. I, I saw a scientist a month ago, he said, denying climate is like denying gravity. There's a lot we don't understand about gravity, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening. And, and that is where we're at, and our colleagues are at, and it is changing, and it is changing even in the last five months because of the climate strike, because of the, because of the reports and, the, and the, the consistent drumbeat from scientists and Greta Thunberg, God love her. So, you know, all I can say is we're doing everything we can, and, and frankly, we need the public deeply engaged with this. And the heartening thing that I've seen, was, there was an audience like this in St. Albans two, three nights ago, two nights ago, when Sarah was getting beat up in St. Johnsbury. I was having a great conversation in St. Albans. And, and at the end, people said, this is really interesting. How do we help? How do we get involved? I have talked, I have been in legislation since 2006. <laughs> I've been engaged since 2006. I've been in the legislature. No one has really ever asked me that in a group setting. There is something palpably different. And, the, and, and our hope is here to, to begin to answer that and to prove to ourselves, legislators, and to the public that, that we can do this. And, and that's why we want to be achievable and significant. And, and not that we're going to say, great, we're done. You know, it's, it's June, we've solved the climate crisis. Not at all. 
that we just are proving we, we have what it takes to, to really <coughs> engage in this crisis. A lot of the country looks to Vermont for these issues. And frankly, it's embarrassing to me that we haven't owned that for the last many years. But you look at land use, go back to Act 250. That was groundbreaking. You look at Act Efficiency of Vermont. There's things that we can be proud of. Regenerative Ag, it's not in our agenda, but Senator Hardy and I serve, serve on the Senate Ag Committee. There is a lot of discussion. Your neighbors are really engaged in discussions around water quality, regenerative ag, sequestering carbon in soils, soil health. There is a lot to be excited about, and I'm an optimist, and I end up telling everybody all this great news, and then I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> it's not near enough. I don't want you to walk away thinking we think it's enough. It's not enough. Well, Chris, uh, I think, um, for one thing, this is an evolutionary process, and a lot of what you're doing is educating people, and that's really important. I have a specific suggestion for people in this audience, and that is to get on the ballot in your town a declaration that we're in a climate emergency. And that, that you can do, you can petition to your select board and get the town's people to vote on it. Now, they may or may not pass it, but it'll be part of the discussion. So that's a specific thing that you can do. What I appreciate about your program is that they are positive things that build on successes that we already <coughs> have. And they're helping to build momentum toward, not solutions, but um, measures that will help us reduce the emergency. And, and uh, it's, it's a starting point. So I appreciate the fact that you're keeping a positive spin on it, but not losing sight that it is a really desperate situation. The one thing that I'm really concerned about is that people are going to start talking about cost. And so another part of the message is the fact that the cost of not doing anything is much higher than the cost of acting. And we're seeing that. I mean, look at the cleanups. Yeah, we're still paying for Irene, for one thing. I mean, that's an easy one to look at. More and more data is coming clear on, on people are projecting what it does if we just maintain the status quo. That will help us, I think. Another thing that's easy to do, and, and actually was talking to some folks maybe down at Shoreham, is local energy committees. Um, just about every town, has the, well, every town has the opportunity to have a, a, a local energy committee. Um, and they, they, we can be really proud. This is another thing that's working well. There's, there's over a hundred of them around the state. <coughs> South Burlington's Energy Committee was runner-up in a national contest in terms of impact <coughs> and reduction of emissions. Uh, they had a competition between cities, and South Burlington ended up being nationally number two, I think. So there's things we can do locally, you know, um, that are meaningful. And certainly a, a discussion <coughs> at town meeting day is very important, but there's a lot of things, and the local officials you know, there's really, when we, when we get these Paris targets and net zero <coughs> in statute, part of what I think it allows us to do is to stop excusing anyone. You know, if you're in the court system, you got to figure out how you're playing a role, right? If you're on the environmental board and you're approving Act 250 permits, you're darn right you got a role in helping us reduce our emissions. And clearly, the Public <coughs> Utility Commission has a role a very strong role in figure, putting us on a sustainable path forward, and 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 towns and our, you know, and our local communities uh, also have to <coughs> deeply engage in that, and, and we can't we can't just shrug it off. Oh, well, that they're not interested. <laughs> it's not an option, and it's increasingly not an option, right? And and I I'll just finish. I'm sorry, I'm rambling on, but I serve on the ag committee with group, and we've been talking, we've been going around the state on some ag issues particularly around wetlands and water. And we had a farmer, we were in Bridport earlier this week, and, uh, and Senator Bray's on the committee with me, and this farmer was talking about culverts that he has to replace that are rotting out on his beef farm, and he was sort of complaining about the process and particularly the federal interface of how farmers get loans and all this blah, blah, blah. And he just finally said, you know, climate change is here, and I've got a lot more water to deal with on my farm. And this was like a, a conservative guy, and, and he was sort of started out being very frustrated about government <laughs> in a small government kind of way, and then, <coughs> and then you know launched into climate change reality. And, and I've, I've heard that up in Essex County in the kingdom from a guy who was like really angry at anyone from Chippewa County that had to do a state legislature 
And and but he he said, yeah, no, clearly we're seeing it. We're seeing it in maple in the way we make uh, sugar our trees and tap our trees. So there, Vermont is. I think we have a lot of foundation to to come together and deal with this because we're not having the conversation that is stopping any conversation in a lot of parts of the country. Let's take another question. Yes, ma'am. Well, I've, I've been advocating for this for a long time, this Global Warming Solutions Act, because if you don't have, you have a goal, that's fine, but if you don't have accountability, then we have something. <coughs> um, so I'm curious how that is going to play out. I mean, I don't want to be suing every, every you know, person I'm suing the Public Utilities Commission, that could take 20 years to get that. So yep. who's going to be watching all those different agencies to yep. make sure that they are going to help us meet the goals? How's that going to happen? That's a great question. Um, so the, the chair of the committee who's working on figuring out what does a Vermont Global Warming Solutions Act look like is looking to the bill that passed in New York State in 2019 and also the one that passed in Maine. And both of those states have what they call a Climate Action Council, which is, uh, you know, secretary level um, uh, leadership, leadership in, in government, but then also supported by uh, some folks from the public who will also have a leadership input. And, and that council would be directed to come back to the legislature and say, we need you to change this law, or we need you to change uh, that appropriation. We need you to concentrate more uh, personnel over here. So that council would do uh, would do the job of kind of setting the, the task list and setting us on the direction. And from that, because that will be a public um, entity, and you'll be able to follow what they are doing and follow the meeting minutes of, of, of their meetings, we will be able to see as citizens to, to assure ourselves, yes, our government is working in the right direction and they're going, you know, they're going as fast as they can or fast enough. Um, so I, that gives me uh, at least uh, a bit of comfort that we'll be able to watch the process at work. Yes, and then back here. So I, I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind is um, is that the driving thing behind all of this is the inherent unsustainability of our lifestyles here in this country. Um, as Matt said to me the other I day. I think the fourth person who asked the question <coughs> asked that very question. So it's well, timely that you're talking about that. As, I, it wasn't planned. Um, but as, as Matt said the other day at another meeting, he said, you know, we're the world's worst roommates. And, and, and I... I that's very true. And, and so when we think of these things, um, you know, replacing one energy source with another source that has less impacts, inherently good, doesn't address the underlying issue. I'll tell you what does from a selfish perspective. I'm, I'm an alderman here in the city of Regents. We need to continue to invest in walkable communities, and, and we need to drive development into population centers along with jobs. Yep. That's the ultimate solution. Most of the world gets around with their feet, a bicycle, or public transportation. And we are sorely, sorely lacking in the state of Vermont. So whatever we can do, and I know that that's not the most popular thing, particularly in some other more rural parts of the state, but that's the ultimate solution. If we change the way we think of things and we change the way we do business, Along with changing the fuel source, that's yep. that's in, in my mind that ought to be our goal. And you know what? You have a beautiful downtown. Thank you. you. You guys are a model for what a walkable community looks like. When I drove out to Diane's <coughs> house earlier this fall, when I was here for a meeting, um, I, I was thrilled that I was you know I felt like I was like several blocks out of town, and yet there was this beautiful sidewalk and people pushing strollers and riding bicycles. I was like, this is just what we want our towns to look like. So good job, and that's a very good point. And Chris touched on that when he, we talked up briefly about you know transportation focus, that we need to be focused not on single occupancy vehicles, but on bicycles, on being a pedestrian, on making sure that the policies in our towns and cities are <coughs> bent towards um, being bike and pedestrian friendly. 
and I would just say, and I think Diane was part of this, it's the state law that when you're um, building, when you're renovating a street, you create a complete street when it's a state road, anything that touches a state road. <coughs> complete street is a tra car travel way, bike way, and a sidewalk. And, and now you basically have to argue your way out of that if you're doing construction. It's not a, a hard mandate, but it is the standard. <coughs> And when, when was that, Diane? You were on the committee, I think. I was on, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago? Maybe eight years, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things on our list is to check in. How are we doing on this? How many people are getting exempted from that? Because it's, it's, you know, and this is a good example, to your point, that's been the law for a long time, and we all felt pretty good about that. And if it's not being adhered to, or if somebody comes and says, we need a waiver because this is going to add 8% to the cost and we don't want to do that. That's where we start to have the hard conversations. Yesterday at Essex and this kind of meeting, one of the first questions this woman put up her hand. She said, why aren't you mandating that we close gas stations? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I don't know. I'd mean, like to stay in the legislature and see if we can keep doing this work. You know, this is, this is tough, though, right? I mean, we're not going to stop letting people drive cars. I mean, the, the, we have to all figure this out together. The, the state has to play a leadership role. Right? In the back row. What do you Oh, well, mine was not nearly as, I think, deep and um, a very valuable perspective that you shared, but rather, I think several of the infrastructure strengths that the state does have that maybe, this has already been mentioned in other meetings, but um, I work in, in the health department, and one of the things that we would, I can't speak for the health department, I can speak as someone who lives in Waltham, near Virgins, that it should be a public health priority now and it's and there's opportunity there when you talk about interagency uh, collaboration and accountability a tool as you know is RBA results-based accountability and our use and reliance um, that the dashboards offer now not many people I think use these dashboards but their performance measures that we, as those who work for the state, 6,000 some people, um, have to roll their work up to. And if we had um, a dashboard around climate accountability, um, I think we could have a more collective look at assessment and tracking toward the goals that are set through the good work you're doing. It actually exists. Energy Action Network has the, has the dashboard that accounts for that. Do you want to say that so everyone hears? Well, so Energy Action Network is tracking our progress from each individual weatherization job and solar system up to uh, initiatives at, at a higher level. And it's all, um, I don't know exactly the website is, but it's on the Energy Action Network website. But it, but it lends itself very obviously to the Global Warming Solutions Act, and it could be a state tool when they're working with their partners to make it happen. I think that's a great idea. I just, I'm sorry. I wanted to mention sorry. something that's also very exciting within this district, and it reminded me when Sarah mentioned coming out past my house is the walkable neighborhood. Not far from my house, just within a few houses, there's a community there at McKnight Lane, for people that live here, that is a little composite of 14 homes that were built that is totally net zero, all 14 of them. And there's battery storage. It's very innovative. It was actually written up in the New York Times. I get very excited. It's at Waltham, you know, Vermont, that they have the capacity that if their grid goes down or energy goes out, they can pretty much self-contain within those 14 homes and they're rented out and from what I am they're Vermont's yep. mm -hmm. so everything about it is very Vermont made yes. and it's uh, kind of a little experiment that's going on there and I'd <coughs> love to see that get more attention and replicate it. Yes, that's outstanding. I love it. Senator? Yeah, so um, thank you for your comment about the public health side of things. So Department of Public Health has been coming into Natural Resources and Energy for a few years running and has been a great partner in terms of um, quantifying health impacts related 
to poor indoor air quality. And so one of the things that we did when we were looking to expand the weatherization program was to say this we need to be mindful of this for public health broadly, but especially for indoor air quality and, and um, homes that are poorly insulated and uh, may have mold and mildew issues and all the rest. And there's even Rutland Regional Medical Center prescribed uh, home energy improvements for people with pulmonary disease because they were treating them in the hospital, sending them home, and they were relapsing and coming back, and they found it cost-effective to make a weatherization investment because they could see how clearly public health. And I think, so your department's been really helpful, and I think we're in, like, early innings and in really making that I, clear. I, yes, and I, yeah, and I work with um, those individuals who are, who are doing that. I think, similar to, you use the analogy of gun control, and are we at the point where we can really come together and and have it as the public health um, issue for Vermont. Because that will, I think, make a difference in pulling together a lot of different factors where people can feel the seriousness of it as well as the hope behind it. Um, so the Thermal Efficiency Task Force um, six or seven years ago put out the report that called for 30 to 40 million dollars a year, on, on, in addition to the programs that are offered right now, to 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 start um, really seriously weatherizing our building stock. And and so, um, it's um, a lot of what you're talking about is great. It's a great start, but this, in order for us to get there, it's going to cost money. So, how are we going to get that? We need a cry from the public to say it makes sense to put a sustained funding source towards weatherization because you can pay that back by the amount of savings that Vermonters are going to keep in their pockets, right? So if we make a public investment right now, every single year from the time your home is weatherized until you sell it and, you know, downsize because you're ready to retire, you're going to be saving money in your pocket. And so we need more Vermonters calling for a sustainable funding source for weatherization. <coughs> and I, uh, well, great. I was just going to, so Act 62 that we just passed, expanding weatherization very modestly, but sort of opening the door to this all fuels energy efficiency program. One of the charges to the PUC, and I think it'll be helpful because of their powers of analysis and bringing stakeholders together, is to do exactly that, to find adequate funding for all fuels efficiency work. So it lets us do not only our electrical work, but again the thermal and transportation. And the things on the table are already, so uh, Chris was talking about TCI, uh, which the initial levels I've heard w is roughly a $20 million um, revenue to the state. Uh, and there's also a thermal rec um, investigation as part of the Act 62 proceeding. So to bring money to when you weatherize, just as we brought a value that subsidized renewable energy, we could say it's just as valuable to reduce demand and bring money into the thermal rec side. There's a health, that we spend six billion on health, so one-tenth of one percent is six million, um, and there's a genuine, there is a genuine health connection. Uh, so that's three, uh, there's, I mean, there, there, there are more streams, and I think we're going to have to um, uh, show some courage and pass some of these things, not just figure them out. There's also um, a discussion underway at Efficiency Vermont with the national lenders, Freddie and Franny, uh, are looking for a way to um, help people at the point of sale when they're signing their mortgage payment. Let's say they're for, to buy a house, let's say they're buying a $300,000 house, the concept is you'd actually get a mortgage for three, $315,000 and uh, with a commitment for that $15,000 to go to the solar, to go to weatherization, to go to something climate related that allows you to shift into a green mortgage, which the lenders are interested in promoting for their own reasons. A green mortgage can be a, a little bit cheaper, actually, and 
one of the interesting dynamics is, believe it or not, the big banks are looking for people who can help them figure this out. So this could be a, an opportunity for Vermont to pilot. One of the things that seems so ridiculous, but they need to know that you actually put your solar up there, right? You're not just greenwashing the bank with your green mortgage and you don't ever invest in solar and you buy a new car, whatever. There, so so there's, there's a sort of responsibility element that could we figure that out? Could, could we have a municipal partner, you know, check off some boxes and really monitor your investment and, and, and help the banks have a, an accountability so that this uh, mortgage product, loan product, could work? I don't know if we'll be able to do that in the short term, but I know those conversations are underway. Now, that's not a tax dollar, but that's something that we could set up that would enable Vermonters to make some of this investment. The other reality is, Riches for Vermonters are enjoying about $330, $330 million a year thanks to the tax cuts from the Trump administration. And some people are interested in maybe we could nick some of that money back and, and That's a good idea. You know, have some investments. I mean, we're going to have to face this. We're clearly going to have to face this more head on than we've been willing to do in terms of really putting the money down. And, you know, we got to get serious about that. But it's not just going to be, you know, the six of us there. You don't win any committee vote, well you maybe win a committee vote, but you don't win floor votes in Montpelier with six votes. And you know, this is where we really need this sustained energy, and I do think the appetite is growing. I just, I just want to comment then, though. so we, I'm with Vermont Gas, we have an efficiency program for the folks that are in Virginia's Middle Bay Area, New Haven, and we just announced uh, last week that we're going to double our efficiency program, so go from three to six million dollars a year, so anybody that's a Vermont Gas customer can get weatherization. So. The, that's a solution. We're willing to put that out there. We think we can do it with PUCs, but we don't necessarily need to have legislative approval. Uh, it's within our, our realm, so we're uh, excited about that. It's really good. It's great. Do more. And they've been, I, I will tell you, Vermont Gas helped me weatherize my home, and, and they have good incentives that was set up around the time, right? Efficiency of Vermont? It's yeah, it's been, it's been 20, it's been 92. And, yeah. So they've been good partners. So um, in 1988, I got Energy five star energy rated home certificate number sixteen issued by Richard Fazy and let us go to the bank and get two percentage points more on our mortgage to do exactly that to get um, because we could get more borrow more money than normally and we put that money into energy <coughs> efficiency and so I don't know quite how we lost that program but we we've tested it and it worked. <coughs> Want to make sure everybody gets a chance. So, anybody, any other yeah. first time question? Yeah. Ask I, think, I think he does. You have a first time yeah. answer. Um, yeah, so Paris goals are going to get us to somewhere around 3.5 degrees Celsius. Yeah, Paris goals are not viable here. I know you're trying to, <coughs> to start the conversation. I've heard the word evolution, evolutionary, a couple of times here. We've got to put an R in front of that word. Sorry guys, we really do need to light it up um, quickly. I really like hearing the idea of doing some redistribution from the highest earners from the high income. <coughs> we also need to not have any more fossil fuel infrastructure, no new fossil fuel infrastructure. We need to start talking about that this isn't going to be a win-win for everybody, especially the wealthy. We're going to have to get rid of this man's employer altogether going to have to go. This is, this is time for radical ideas, and we'll be there pushing it. Yep. Well, uh, I think one, I wonder to what extent you're examining <coughs> current tax and fee structures for ways that they could be readjusted. And I have one specific idea that I uh, know of a, another jurisdiction where this happens, and that is uh, taxing automobiles based on emissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> I would favor raising the taxes on automobiles a lot. But for those who want to have a revenue neutral idea, we could simply change the way all the money is collected so that if you have an emission free automobile, you don't pay a purchase tax, you don't pay an annual renewal. Right. And that, and I paid two hundred and twenty-two dollars to get a Nissan Leaf renewed for two years. That should be put on a car that emits a lot. 
So I think that's one specific idea, but I think there may be other areas where we can take existing revenue streams and direct them in this direction. So we, we commissioned a study of the agency of transportation to figure, help us figure out how to do that. And some jurisdictions have done um, exactly that. You, you, you uh, register a less efficient vehicle, you pay more. You register a more efficient, you pay less. This, they've all repealed that law. And in fact, if you saw a few weeks ago, Washington State um, went backwards on a, a citizen referendum around uh, car registration. They, they blocked it, it's 30 bucks for everybody now in Washington State. So, you know, they, they, and, and, and I just throw this back on you guys. I mean, the, like, we are in the democratic process only allows us to go so far compared to the <coughs> citizenry. Now, what we studied, we call it a fee-based study. And so the, the thing that I think is hopeful in this is that you don't say, you buy a truck, you pay more, you buy a Prius, you pay less. You say, you buy a truck, you gotta pay, if you wanna buy the most efficient truck, you'll pay less. If you wanna buy the least efficient truck, you pay more. If you wanna buy a passenger vehicle, you know, so you keep it within those classes. Now, you know, does that move us fast enough? No. Does that mean that we get to have this program and you start to have a price signal at the registration point? Yes, it does. This is forever balancing. And, you know, we, we have, at any given week, and the Climate Caucus usually meets Thursday at noon in Montpelier. You're all welcome to come. There will be between 10 of us and 50 of us there, depending on what's going on that day. And we have activists come in all the time and, and complain to us. And, you know, that's fine. That is the role. That's what we understand we're signing up for. But the folks who are on the Climate Caucus are trying to figure out what we can push, how badly we can push our colleagues. You know, we need to be confronting the governor who has not been putting ideas on the table. We need to be confronting, frankly, legislators who aren't in the Climate Caucus to be galvanizing this. And, and you know, we have a role to play and the public has a role to play. I can tell you that the, the, we have noticed a difference. We had a meeting like this in Richmond, and the local rep was sick. And, and the, the host very kindly said three times, she's part of the Climate Caucus, but she can't be here tonight. And it wasn't us, you know, it was, it was the local energy committee, actually. And, and it just showed, like, that's never happened before. So there is pressure, the pressure is working. Will it be fast enough? Probably not. Will it be significant enough for us to stave off? You know, I sure hope so. I got kids. I mean, that's what we're all trying to do here. It's, we're aware of the science. The question is, will the political system catch up? The question is about uh, leadership, and you sort of alluded to it just now. Well, leadership starts with the governor, and, and he's been getting a pass. And I've been encouraging everybody I know to, you know, to write him letters. Amen, and sister. I can say you're yeah. speaking my language. Yeah. So start with the governor, but I'm also concerned about the, the, you know, the House and Senate leaders, and I just want to know where they stand on this. Are you, are they going to hold it back? Are they going to listen to the people? Are they going to listen to the Climate Solutions Caucus? Where? Do, I know you can't say anything about the governor because who knows what he thinks. But what are <laughs> well, I'm going to say something about the governor anyway. Right. So this is a, that was a perfect segue to uh, to run through the last couple of slides, and then if there are any other lingering questions, because we do have some slides in here that are really meant to be a call to action for people who who believe that we need to be doing more and we need to be doing it faster. So first things first, um, you can if you are a part of any of those organizations and groups. Uh, or if you care to join them, many of those organizations are out there organizing around climate, organizing around uh, pushing for some of the bills that we've been talking about tonight, and many of them also do regular updates from, uh, from Montpelier. So if there's any of those organizations that you are a part of, just make sure that you're getting their emails. Now, first and foremost, we need executive leadership. We are a citizen legislature, and we are in session from January until the middle of May, okay? So that is a very short window, and we do not have, uh, you know, we do not have a staff of scientists, a staff of, uh, you, you know, fit, a, staff. a staff at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, you know, we're doing, we're getting up to 
speed as fast as we can. We're relying on the good information that many of our neighbors in, uh, in Vermont have been bringing to us as they've been coming to these meetings. Um, we need the governor to be on track and part of the team. Okay? Right now, there are three questions that I think people should be asking the governor. Because he said that we would meet our Paris climate goals, but what has he done since then? So somebody needs to be asking him, did you mean it? Uh, he, he did uh, appoint a climate action commission, and there were a lot of very smart people who served on his climate action commission and came up with some 52 or 53 recommendations. And you want to know how many of those the governor has implemented? None. None. Exactly none. none. You are correct. So, which of your Climate Action Commission recommendations are you going to implement this year? And then, the third question, which is super important in terms of <coughs> our urgency to act now, which, what are we going to see in your budget this January when you present it to us, the middle of January, that is going to help meet the challenge of climate crisis? Now, the legislature took the, the governor's little piddly uh, recommendations of spending on EV incentives and spending on a few other little things, and we added to that last year. But honestly, when the governor's budget starts at zero or nothing, it makes it that much harder for the legislature to pull revenue from someplace else, from some other part of state government, and put it into what we know we need to be doing, which is to accelerate this transition away from greenhouse gases. And so we need the governor to be presenting something in his budget in January, and that's why these questions are up here. Do you want to add anything to that? No. So I can keep right on the roll. Um, so you also want to ask your House and Senate members, and many of them are here, um, so you, you don't have to ask them because you can see that they're committed to this, and, and many, many of the folks in this room are going to be part of the solutions that we're developing in our... Uh, in our committees. Uh, but there are other House members and other senators, and you are welcome to call the leadership of the House and the Senate and also make your wishes known. They, they may not have the time to get back personally to, uh, you know, to a whole slew of Vermonters calling them. Um, but, but this is a simple question, right? Are you on board with the climate agenda? And, and I would say to your question about legislative leaders, we're seeing a shift there too. Um, the um, Tim Ash, the president of the Senate, is going to be the lead sponsor of the TCI bill, <coughs> enabling bill, um, and, and he's part of the transportation committee and, and brought forward the fee-based study and <coughs> a lot of you know was instrumental in updating some of that. Um, and and I would just say a week ago, not even Sunday, um, was the first Youth Climate Congress in. In my theater, and it was awesome. I mean, was anybody there? Were, were you guys there? Well, there were young people there, but they're not. Yeah, there. and and there was what 200 young people from around the state. There was 40 schools represented. Just we we sat there from the gallery in awe as they did a roll call of the <coughs> schools, and it took them 15 minutes to name all the schools. It was really really cool. The state chamber, the red room, is being painted right now, and and we we often when we're just in, in ahead of between leaf peeping season when tourists are flooding into the building and when we get there in January they do a lot of renovations in the state house it's, we work in a museum and the uh, sergeant at arms told the youth climate youth climate congress that they couldn't use the chamber because they're painted and the speaker of the house called the climate the sergeant at arms and said no you're not you're going to do that renovation next week those kids are coming and it's a small thing, it doesn't change policy at all, but it's a signal of the intensity that people are feeling. And, and so, you know, where that, where that lands us in mid-May, I don't know. But we've got a lot of good signals. We've got a clear signal that the Senate will lead on TCI. We've got a clear signal that the House will lead on the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and we've got deep interest from Vermonters and from legis all of our legislative colleagues, most of our legislative colleagues, that, that this is a priority. So. I think there's a lot of reason to think that we can make progress in the short term. And there you go, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. This is a group of young people, not from this past weekend, but from one of the previous uh, youth climate um, uh, days at the State House. And, uh, you know, I have three daughters who, uh, who are college age right now. Um, I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to have the same 
uh, the, the, the same kind of um, success in life that, uh, that you and I all know, um, to be able to live in a beautiful state and, and, uh, and have an environment around us that sustains us and allows us to you know, grow our own food and, uh, and even generate our own electricity. Um, I know that there's a lot that we need to do in order to uh, make sure that that happens for the future generation. And um, I, the thing that I like about this picture right here is, is these four guys right here. Right? <laughs> they're so from Virgins. When they're, they're from yeah, Virgins. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm, a, I'm right there. That is totally. Are you really, That's awesome. Yeah. So that is totally why I put this into the slide deck because yes, I, mean. I, want, I want you to know that when the pitchforks come, I'm going to be on the right side of the pitchforks yeah. because. We, you know, like enough is enough. Now we need to get it done. There's, there's no more time to argue. There's no more time to waste. We need to get it done. And so I really thank you all for, uh, for coming out tonight. Um, we'll hang around if you want to have any follow-up conversations afterwards. Senator Hardy. I just want to add um, thank you to Sarah and Chris and all the members that have worked so hard on the Common Solutions Caucus. I am a member of the caucus, but I have not put in nearly as many hours as these two have and other members. And it's, I think, been a remarkable amount of collaboration and work that I think is, I haven't been, I've only been there a year, so I can't say unprecedented, but incredibly, unprecedented. incredibly impressive and potentially unprecedented because I just, I've been really impressed with how they've gone about their work and the public relations campaign that they're doing. And so I just want to thank you as one of your colleagues and you know, support for all of the work that you're doing. And also just to reiterate something that um, Chris said, that there are a lot of other smaller things that are embedded in a lot of other bills and a lot of other work that people are doing across the committees. Um, so, you know, health, public health, agriculture, um, you know, government ops and general affairs. Um, Housing. Appropriations, healthcare, I mean, there are all these things, um, obviously natural resources, that we're going to be working on that are a, a smaller, not, you know, banner things, but are still super important. So just thank you both. Yeah. And, thank you so much. And um, just on that theme, I want to give a special shout out to Mari. Mari and Chris and I and, and two other legislators are on the kind of leadership crew and you know sometimes it's moving heaven and earth to get us all on a, a, a an hour-long call every other week but we're doing it because we believe in this and thank you Mari for helping with all of the public engagement organizing I know that it has been a lot of time away from uh, from job and family and all of that um, but thank you all for hearing the call to come out and talk about climate on a Friday night and <laughs>